can read the PowerPoint will actually convert it to PDF. Uh, this presentation here is on um, befriending our native pollinators. And it's a very better, it's a it's a very important thing that we do because there's been a whole ton of pollen collapse and we're losing a lot of our pollinators. And I hate to spread fire. I used to be in IT security and we talk about fight, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And I like my presentations to be uplifting. Uh, the, the key takeaway to this is that um, you can really do something about the decline in the bees. I just want to tell you one thing. Uh, one of the reasons, and people talk about GMOs, GMOs, did they really hurt you? Did they really kill you? Or what have you? But a lot of, the, they do, they do um, attribute to the colony collapse and the decline of our pollinators. One reason is because we, in order to get crops to grow really sturdily, um, we, we make them resistant to the pesticides. Because if we didn't, all the weeds would grow. So we make them resistant to the pesticides. So they spray pesticides on these GMO, genetically modified crops, and the weeds stop growing and the plants keep growing. Uh, and then they take up the, the, uh, the pesticides in them. So the bees, when they go to pollinate, like the little doobies that they're supposed to be doing, they actually die or they get sick from the, the GMO plants that are immune to that pesticide. Really what we want people to do, what I, we try to get people to do, is grow a lot of the food that you can on your own, in community gardens and pots and, and the plots and raised beds, etc. And um, also, be wary of labels, you know, be wary of your labels. And understand that feeding, you know, I, I used to think, I'll just, I don't care if I use pesticides over here because these are only flowers, no one eats flowers, you know, no one eats flowers, they're not my edibles. But consequently, what we're doing is we're destroying the, uh, the bees. So, so anyway, this presentation isn't just on bees. Bees do 70% of our pollinating of our, of our uh, crops here, 70%. Okay, oops, here. Uh, okay, there we go. Butterflies do some as well, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the butterflies, and especially my favorites, because I, I had some fun actually helping to raise some monarch butterflies last year with my milkweed. And our hummingbirds, we have one type of hummingbird that grows that lives here in New England. It's also a migratory bird. We see them come in May. We'll go over that as well. And then, of course, our friends, um, the bees. So, but before we go into anything, I, there is a disclaimer. I, I have to tell you that these are not bees. They look an awful lot like bees. They're the same size as a honeybee. And they're yellow and they're black. And they look an awful lot like a bee, but they're not a bee. This is a yellow jacket. How many times I've mistaken a yellow jacket for a bee because they didn't look close enough? Well, this is definitely a yellow jacket. They say that they're really actually a wasp. They're similar in the size, but uh, they don't pollinate. Bees pollinate because they have fuzzy, fuzzy stuff all over their bodies. These are very smooth. But what they do, they're also very important in the garden, not as important as bees. What they do is they eat a lot of the aphids and the bad pests from our gardens. So they're actually very good uh, and useful. So we try not to spray them uh, with pesticides either. But a nest can hold 1,500 little soldiers that are just dying to sting you. And unlike the honeybee, which is the only bee, uh, only bee wasp or whatever that actually loses its stinger and dies when it stings you, the, um, this one's a little bit more aggressive. So make sure when you see the stripes here, and you see the yellow and the black, that ain't no bee. Is he your friend? Yes, he's your friend, but keep your distance. A lot of times you see on your, on your deck or in the, the corners of your house, you'll see them, and you'll see where they fly. I don't spray them with any pesticides. If they do get too aggressive and the nests are too big, I actually will spray them with a hose. I don't know, they probably die, unfortunately, but I can't have a granddaughter, you know, I can't. 
be who they are. But in any case, so just to put things in proper perspective, because I've had some bad experiences with, uh, with them. It is not a bee. Okay, so let me see if I can play this. Yes, this, if you look really closely at it, okay, and I want to explain to you what this is. I went one time to Bellingham, South Bellingham, and it was um, the beef bar, and I was sitting there waiting for my son to join me, and sitting out in the parking lot, and I noticed this is a beautiful perennial garden, and that's what we're going to go over here today, is how to grow a perennial garden so that your bees will come in, your pollinators will come back year after year, that the flowers will keep coming back. This is Salvia, the mint family. Back here, you'll see some black-eyed Susans, and uh, you'll see some, some hot, short little hyacinth, and all kinds of stuff. But as you can see, I'm sitting, the garden is, starts here. The bees are buzzing around. I'm, I'm sitting right next to them, holding my camera. And then, so, these are bumblebees, the big, fat bumblebees. I love them. When I'm in the garden, I say, thank you very much for your work. So there they are, tons and tons and tons. Now, I think that must be a very rich garden with a lot of, you know, good, good uh, uh, humus matter or uh, compost or something. Uh, but this, they're all perennials, and I don't know who designed it. It's in the beef barn, for heaven's sake, in South Bellingham. Who would have thought that somebody, but they actually knew what they were doing because um, they had just hordes and hordes of bees. I think maybe they did it. Because it was, I was going to ask them who designed this garden for you, because it's absolutely lovely. But you find stuff in the uh, in the oddest of places anyway. Okay, very good. All right. Now you see these crop. So being a being a vegetable gardener, why am I having this discussion about how to grow all these lovely flowers? Because um, I I I reap the benefits, and, and we all do. Okay. So. These, especially a lot of the crops that are, that cross pollinate. I have apple trees. I have peach trees. I have pear trees. Oh, pears are not pear. Plums, cherries, melons, strawberries, blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, cranberries, onions, beans, sunflower, cauliflower, um, broccoli, turnips, Brussels sprouts. Oops, come on now. There we go. So we have a lot of those things that we eat every day that we, we wouldn't be able to eat if it weren't for the, um, for the pollinators. So we certainly have to take care of them. There we go. Okay, so just to talk to you a little bit about, uh, you know, we talked about bees and you see a lot of, is anybody a beekeeper? You know a beekeeper? Okay, so a lot of the, a lot of bees, uh, you know, people think of bees, they think of the honeybees that people grow, uh, that, that people raise basically for the honey. They come out in the day, they do their pollinating. They're actually absolutely remarkable creatures. They can go a mile away from the hive, do their, do their work, and then come back and, uh, to the hive at night to protect the queen. But, uh, but honeybees, are not native to New England. They're actually, they're immigrants um, from Europe. They came from England. So and we don't know hundreds of years from now if they're ever going to be considered, uh, they're considered, uh, you know, natural, or what the effect will be. I'm sure it'll be, probably be, be fine, but I just want to differentiate the fact that they're the most powerful pollinators. They're the only bee that's, they're the most harmless of bees because it's the only one that will die if it stings you. Nobody wants to die, so you know it's going to do anything it can to, you know, to stay clear of you. Uh, but we have several bees species here in uh, in New England. 370 different kinds of bees. I did, I believe me, we don't have the time to go over all 300. So I'm going to put them in put them in a few buckets for you. This is a bumblebee. I love the bumblebees. Uh, they're so nice and fluffy. You can see them. Pretty much see the pollen hanging off of them, uh, but most of the bees native to New England are actually actually don't live 
They don't make honey and they don't live in the trees. They're actually ground, live in the ground. Have you ever stepped on a hive? So, yeah, you say, why is a bee down here? Well, that's where they live most of the time. So anyway, you have your, uh, you have your, whatever this word is, in, in Dranadea, mostly ground, masters, and uh, most, a lot of the bees do not have a queen. They don't clump together like that. They're actually solitary, solitary uh, creatures. And I'm going to tell you, and when I go over what they eat, I'm just going to, because not all of them have the same diet. So in order to entice a lot of these native, native bees, you have to have a good variety of stuff. So I'm going to go over some of the stuff that they need. And when I do this, as I say, I'm going to concentrate on perennial. I like to make things easy for myself. And I want to make things easy for you. I really want you to do this, do it with your kids. And I think, um, you know, I'm going to show you uh, the perennials that grow, keep, keep growing. Some of them are actually wild. I want to tell you where to get the seed, what to do with the soil. Um, and, and also, the, some flowers are self-seeding annuals. I have a, I have a, a crop, actually Terry and uh, Rachel, I know you've, you've partaken of my borax. So borax is a, is a, I got some seeds from the Seed of the Month Club. I grew it and it comes about yay high, has beautiful purple flowers on it. The bees absolutely love it. You can eat the leaves, they taste like cucumber, you can actually even eat the flower. But it's, it's not a perennial, it doesn't come back year after year, but it does. What happens is it drops its seed, and just as sure as, it, as, a, just as, sure as a perennial is to come back, that thing is uh, just as sure to, to drop a seed, it comes up, I have them all over my garden, I have to pull them up. So we'll, we'll go over with some, some self-seeding uh, self hardy, they call them hardy annuals as well. But basically the emphasis is going to be on the perennial plants. Uh, milkweed, we'll go over a couple of them. Coneflower, I have wild coneflower. Uh, goldenrod, make you sneeze. Clover, white clover. Dandelion, other clovers. Okay, so I want to talk about this. You'll see this keep coming up, dandelion. I hate dandelion. I've been plagued by dandelions. You have a nice lawn, and is, but what do you see coming up is this dandelion. Then in the fall, you see that little fuzzy things come up, and the seeds go all over. You know you're doomed, right? But dandelions are actually a superfood. You can eat the stem, you can eat the leaves, you can make a, a salt that's actually very healing. It's actually an incredible plant. Of course, you probably have to grow it in some cleaner circumstances than out by the road where you know it gets sprayed with dirt and salt and you know from the from the trucks and all that. And you'll see a lot of this as well. We see a lot of different kind of clovers. Clovers and dandelion grow low the ground. Well we just determined that a lot of the bees are ground dwellers, so it's very appropriate for them. So then we have some that after day is social and solitary. Those are your honeybees. I put them in there because they don't have you know, because like I say, they're such a part of our culture now, although they aren't really native. Uh, bumblebees, carpenter bees, and more. You'll see they eat, every, anybody see a little, everybody grow lupine? It's a really beautiful flower. They grow wild, go all the way up in Maine. I figured something can grow all the way up in Maine, where it's so cold, zone four, it can grow down here in zone six. They also like a certain, a rose species, again, goldenrod, again, that dandelion and that iron bee. Some of these will make you sneeze, but these love it. Okay, so you have the, this one, call it collect today. Um, solitary bees make up 2,500 species. Okay, they actually give solid pollen balls to their young. Plaster bee, mask bee. And their nests are like plaster, really hard. Okay, again, the goldenrod, and a species in the rose family. We have this species down here. These are called sweat bees. Anybody have a sweat bee? You're working out in the gym and they're, you know, you're, you're, you're going from your car to your house and, and they'll come. They love the smell of sweat. So uh, they eat butterfly wheat, black eyed Susans, coneflowers, buttercups, milkweed, Canadian goldenrod, lilac, and this giant blue high stalk, which seems to be popping up all over the place. Giant blue high stalk. Okay, so the other one is, uh, oh my goodness, I'm not going to touch it, but you can see it. I'll send you the presentation, okay? So they, they carry the pollen on their, um, 
on the abdomen, so they're very efficient pollinators, okay? Those are your mason bees, your leaf cutter bees, very common, okay? They, what do they like? They like blueberries, cranberries, and again, that giant blue high saw, clover again, and the iron bee. Okay. All right, so, this is what bees see over here when you look at this flower, okay? And this is what we see. They see ultraviolet uh, rays, and, and, and we don't see them. What Mother Nature is training them to is, is training them to do is where's the pollen? The pollen is right here, where these uh, white spots are. And you see the lines? These are the roads go to pollen. So this is what Mother Nature is teaching them to do with their eyes is to uh, to go you know, find the pollen. This is what we see. We barely have a hamburger, right? So we know that we're not enticed to, to go for the pollen. Okay, so I did want to tell you um, about, we know how to, now we'll, we'll, we'll go over some other stuff and how to put the garden together, how to feed and all that. Also, Bees are incredibly, you know they say you're busy as a bee. Bees are incredibly hard workers. They will work and work and work until they die. They have lonely lives. You put all those bees protecting that one, uh, that one uh, queen. But uh, it's a really good idea to give them a drink once in a while. And they like, they like, you don't even really have to have anything fancy like this. You can just put a few marbles or a few rocks in a pie plate. That's a bee there. Can you see it right there? Uh, so what they do is they don't want to, you don't want them to drown. You want to give them a place that they can, you know, stand on and go in and take a drink. So that's basically some people put pretty marbles. Some people use something higher like a like a bird uh, bird bath type of thing. But they don't need high because a lot of your native pollinators are live in the ground. But it's a good idea to give them, uh, to give them some water. Sometimes you see them, you'll go up to them. You don't know if they're dead or alive. They're just so exhausted from all that work. So, okay. So here, here, I just kind of summarized. There are several, several uh, types of flowers, but these are a few that we saw repeatedly that are very nice and uh, perennial. One is this uh, goldenrod. It grows everywhere. Uh, and the ironweed, you keep seeing the ironweed come up as well in those handy dandy little dandy lines. I, I wish they would just grow where I put them and not everywhere else. But what happens, of course, is you know when they go to seed, they, they have that fluffy stuff and the seeds blow all over the place. And then the lupine are absolutely gorgeous. So you can incorporate those wildflowers into, into your garden to attract your, um, your bees. This one has some, but that's okay. We're just going to watch a little bit of it, uh, just to show you how beautiful these are. And I want to listen to you, Mr. Oh. Yeah. You see, what they have is they have it's like a, a proboscis or a, uh, something that goes and in, in, dips into the flowers to actually uh, get the nectar and the pollen. So they're beautiful. Does anyone does anyone uh, does anyone have a hard time distinguishing a, a, a moth from a butterfly? It's really quite simple. When a when a when a butterfly is at rest, his, his wings are, you can see like half, half a butterfly, his, his wings are up. A, 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 a moth, the wings will go into that. Moths are also good um, pollinators, but not quite as, uh, as good as the, uh, the butterflies. So it's, it's quite lovely. So, and there's a reason I actually uh, did that one. Oops. I've seen just about every one of these butterflies in my garden. 
And I like to hike, I like to go up to the White Mountains and hike, and I've seen a lot of, that west, tons and tons of the swallow fields up in the White Mountains as well. So these are definitely like it here, the black swallow field. Whenever you see something, you'll see something like this. A lot of times they eat your dill and your uh, carrot, uh, queenie's lace. You'll see them out there. Um, and then they'll turn into these beautiful butterflies. Eastern swell tail, Canadian swell tail. This looks similar to the black, except it's a pretty gray. It's got some blue tones in it. And they all start from these ugly little curves. So there's another thing is, um, there's a, there's, a, there's a bug that we got as hay, and that's the uh, tomato hornworm. Has anyone ever had a tomato hornworm? They're this long, but long, long, long as this, and then that, that round. And they will decimate, they don't, some, some bugs will take the leaves and eat the leaves, and some will eat the stem, and some will eat the fruit. This one will decimate the whole plant of your, your uh, peppers or your, your tomatoes. But that, when that uh, uh, caterpillar actually hatches, it's, a, uh, it's called a hummingbird moth. It's obviously not a hummingbird, but it's a hummingbird moth. It's about the same thing. It's absolutely beautiful. And you would think that it's like a hummingbird because it's about almost the same size and, and the way it flaps its wings. Um, anyway. Here's some more. I saw this in my garden, the American copper, the brown elephant. And these are quite common, orange sulfur and the white sulfur. They're very pretty. It's a nice project. Take your kids around out in the garden and see how many different types of butterflies they can find. So I want to tell you the, a story about the, the monarchs. Uh, the monarchs. Uh, migrate 3,000 miles from Mexico all the way to Canada every year. But it's not the same monarch uh, because one will fly from Mexico to maybe uh, California or maybe Missouri or someplace. It will uh, lay its eggs and the eggs will hatch and then they'll come to New England and that one will lay its eggs and it will hatch and then it will go to Canada. So you get three different generations that it takes to do one trek up. But how do they know to take that trek? It's just an amazing uh, thing. It's, it's just an incredible thing uh, from nature. Uh, but there's hundreds of millions of them on that same trek, reproducing on the way. So habitat loss in the US and Mexico is a, a, a threat to the Moana uh, population. Uh, after decades of effort, Mexico curved the deforestation of the, the butterflies. Uh, but the loss of milkweed in the United States, and I have a little bit on it, uh, the loss of milkweed in the United States is hurting things because milkweed, well, let me, let me finish these first, okay? Uh, also, uh, many farmers plant herbicide resistant versions of crops which allow them to spray their fields with things that kill the weeds and because the crops are hardy, the crops that don't die suck up all the bad stuff, hence killing the, uh, these wonderful, beautiful pollinators. Last year, the number of monarchs that migrated to Mexico was the lowest ever recorded, covering a mere 0.67 hectares of forest. A hectare is 2.4 acres, so maybe a little more than an acre. It used to be 21 um, hectares back in 1996. So the problem is real. So people type pesticides on the problem. The problem is real. Not a political thing. So this is, I'm not going to show this video because there's no sound. Oh, wait a minute. What the heck? We can just talk. Oh my goodness.
shot. So here, see, here they are, the monarchs. They're eating uh, this plant, this milkweed plant. Have everybody seen a milkweed plant, right? Come to those big pods that open up and all the milkweed flies, flies out. Like you see, yeah. So there's like 160 different kinds of milkweed here in the United States. And what this, what did he, see, she only dropped one egg. She drops those eggs all around, okay? And uh, she does that so that another, a predator who attacks the eggs won't get them all. So she's kind of smart that way. Uh, the thing is that uh, milkweed is poison to most um, critters. Um, there are some, like ants, that have become immune to it after a while, they'll go after the eggs. But, um, but they plant their eggs in the milkweed because, because basically, like I said, milkweed is poison to a lot of predators. So, okay. All right. So, to grow, to attract butterflies, not just those lovely, uh, the, the lovely monarchs, but butterflies in general. Again, we see this golden rod. You see the butterfly bush. I guess there's a reason they call it butterfly bush, right? Because it, it attracts the, uh, the butterflies. Uh, again, that milkweed. Uh, I should actually say, they sell milkweed, uh, you know, the, uh, the seeds. But I should say, so a friend of mine gave them to me when I first moved into my house, we dug some up, and we didn't know what it was going to take. And a, and a couple of years later, we, we had some nice milkweed growing. They're kind of clumpy plants, they're not all that pretty, um, but I did see some, um, some monarchs last year. So, And I haven't seen this, I, I'm not really an entomologist, you know, I'm a scientist of insects or anything, but I, I always saw one egg, and I'm saying, well, that's how awfully strange. You think she. You know, she lay a whole bunch of eggs like those nasty squash beetles do. So Queen Anne's lace. Does anybody have Queen Anne's lace? It is a Queen Anne's lace. I get, I have them growing. They grow wild. It's in the carrot family. Very pretty, but um, they they get out of, they get out of control as well. So uh, those are all hardy annuals that you can uh, grow to attract the, the butterfly. So. This is, let me show you this. is my uh, friend. Uh, this is the ruby-throated hummingbird. And that is the only bird, the only hummingbird that uh, lives here in Massachusetts. You'll see he, he, looks, he looks kind of bland, and, but his, his, his neck is bright red, but it's not, it's iridescent. So at some angles it looks like that, very black. And then when he turns, it'll, it'll be bright red. The, uh, the females uh, aren't so pretty. They're, of course, they have to stay in the nest and, and take care of the eggs. So they're uh, you know, kind of neutral color. But they have very weak legs. So when you see one, even when they sleep, you see them. And then the only, you know, you never obviously see an owl or what have you just hovering there. They actually hover like a, like an insect, like a helicopter, but there's nothing up here. But, uh, but you see the, uh, those are the ruby-throated uh, hummingbirds. Okay. And here, yeah, so just to go over them, uh, they spend their winters in Central America, Mexico, and Florida. And they come up here. Uh, in the summer to breed. And it's the most common hummingbird east of the Mississippi in North America, and it's the only one that grows here. You see the, the mama, she wants to keep a low profile so nobody will get her, uh, her, her young. Uh, so there are only two, has anybody ever seen one? I don't feed them sugar, by the way. I don't know how good it is to feed them table sugar. I know they also have the same eyes. They can see the, uh, uh, the, the colors like the, the uh, colors like the bees as well. So, but they're only 2.8 to 3.5 inches tall. Their wingspan's about uh, 
three and a half inches wide, and they weigh between two and six grams in weight. That's about, at the most, two ounces, so they're very, very light. So the adults are metallic green above and grayish white below with almost black wings. Those wings are flapping 70 times a second. So the, as I said, the legs are so weak as you see the, the bird in, the, uh, in that picture. He was just kind of hopping around a little bit. The legs are very weak. Uh, they, they're most, they mostly stay in flight even when they sleep. And they live a long life. They live a good seven years. So. Uh, I've never had a hummingbird feeder, but I did have some out in my vegetable garden. So they obviously like something. It was probably that more art. Okay, so wildflowers that grow to, to attract the hummingbirds that, that drink the, the nectar. They have that long beak and they have to they stick it in there to get the nutrition. So they like the columbine, they like the honeysuckle, the salvia, pink turtle head, and they love the bee bodies who want it right there. They're so pretty. So, now we get to the gardening part, enough of all the insects, right? So, uh, in order, in order to entice the native pollinators to your, to your yard, it's optimal. See, the native pollinators have been, have been living off the natural flora and fauna for, for as long before we even inhabited um, the, the United States. So uh, it's in their best interest to feed them what they're used to eating and give them an abundant meal. So the wildflowers, and you can tell the ones I, the ones, the, the pictures that I showed you, those flowers are all native to this area. So also, since the many bees uh, live in the ground, uh, don't forget it's very important for those low flop, the low, uh, the low uh, plants like the dandelion, dandelion and the clover. So the hummingbirds and the and the uh, the butterflies have that long proboscis that they can stick their snouts into, and they like the long thin flowers. So the hummingbirds, as well as the bees, see in the ultraviolet light, which is why the bright reds, pinks, orange stand out more easily to them. Many fruits, vegetables, flowers, and seeds uh, are bright colored. They stand out to animals and uh, uh, hummingbirds uh, and the insects more so than humans. So we just read the package or, or grab something in the store, right? They, they, Mother Nature helps them out with it. So it's a great idea to harvest your own wild fl wildflowers um, as they, they die off into the fall each year. And what you need to, what you should do is when you do harvest them, take them, dry them out completely, and then put them in a little, I have a little tiny, I'm going to show you one. They have all sizes of these. Here's some, oh my goodness, what is this? Oh, this is some, these are some cucumber seeds you gave me. Okay. So, uh, little bags like this, and then take a marker and write on what it is and keep them someplace nice and cool. So, that's what I do to, to store my seed. Um, in case you want to expand your garden. I'm always expanding my garden, so. Uh, when, uh, as again, again, when you choose your flowers, make sure, when you buy any kind of flower, any kind of plant, uh, wherever you get it, we get it at Home Depot when they order seeds from Burpee. It always will tell you if it's an annual or it's a perennial on it. So just be aware of uh, uh, read your labels or send us an email and we'll tell you. Okay, so in summary, stay away from, from weed killers. You may have a lot of weeds, you may say, you know what, I'm going to kill all the weeds and, and then I'm going to go, you know, plant 
some flowers that we have here. Uh, but you never know if that weed kill is going to be taken up, unless it's specifically it's some organic kind and it says, you know, it's harmless or what have you. I would stay away from weed killers, and I'll tell you, instead of weed killers, what you can do is you can do a good job of mulching um, to keep the weeds away. And I'll, I'll go over that as well. Um, do not use any chemical pesticides, the same thing, but you can, you can hurt your, your pollinators. Um, so also, people don't realize this, but even when, like, we get questions all the time. We, we're doing a whole slew of, you know, presentations. We have 13 presentations we, we're constantly rolling about. And we're always getting questions about um, insecticides. How do I keep this critter away? How do I keep that critter away? So we say one of the uh, more natural solutions is get some water, put in a little bit of dish soap, a little bit of cayenne pepper, and squeeze a few cloves of garlic in there and then strain them up and strain the garlic out the next day. And, uh, and what happens is you spray it on the plant and, uh, and if, it, if the plant, if the, if the insect inhales the soap, it won't be able to breathe and the uh, cayenne bar will slide off, you know, if it's getting on a soapy, slippery uh, surface, it will slide off. And if it doesn't like the smell of the, the, the capsicum in the, in the pepper. And uh, it doesn't like the smell of garlic. Anytime you want to repel insects, put some onion and garlic. They don't really, uh, most critters don't, don't like them, most, most uh, pests. Uh, however, if something, uh, if something is going to deter pests, it's, it may deter the bees as well. So you have to use things only when you need them and only as much as you need them. Even the natural stuff can deter bees as well. There are some remedies that they say are safe for bees, neem oil or what have you, but do your research before you use any kind of uh, insecticide. Questions? Okay, so I don't, typically when you're growing as I say, I don't have to say, you, you guys all know we're all, we're, we're big vegetable gardens. So we used to, Eric's used to grow in these mother of all watermelons like yay big and, and corn that stands eight feet tall and has big ears, you know. And um, so they need a lot of, they need a lot of um, nutrients in the soil. Plants, uh, flowers don't typically need you know, high-powered fertilizers and all that. They may need, I mean, you can get put a little rose food if you, or whatever's appropriate, but they really don't need as much. So, but the main thing um, when, you, when you grow them is that um, you want to keep them fed in a natural way. So every year in the spring, um, what I do is I add com compost to them. Some nice rich uh, humus or some compost right into the soil and that will help to feed them so you don't have to use toxic uh, fertilizers and you know I don't have anything against miracle grow but I don't know what it does. To, I know it works perfectly well on the plants but I don't know what it does to the, uh, to the bees but in any case you just use a lot of good uh, compostable, very rich soil and supplement it on a, on a yearly basis uh, in the spring. Also, uh, in uh, what you do to, to keep the weeds away, because you know none of us are going to use weed killers, right? So what we have to do to keep the weeds away is uh, we have to mulch over, and that's the best way to keep the weeds from growing. I'm going to tell you uh, when you have nice rich soil and your plants love it, guess what? The weeds are going to love it too. And you can grow something in a raised bed where there's no weeds coming up from the from the bottom, but some of them are going to blow in and they're going to grow just right alongside them. But if you mulch over with some kind of um, organic solution, you know, organic mulch, then you know that would be safe. What I would use is the same basic things that I'm talking about in, uh, when I, I'll talk about growing vegetables or raised beds or what have you is ground up uh, leaf 
your fall leaves. You put them in the compost or whatever you have left over. If you don't have any left over, come on over to my house. I have the woods out back and I have a ton of uh, ground up. Uh, you, you, you mow them over with your, with your lawn morning. It's nice. Or you can go to Adway or someplace and get a bale of straw and put it over. And that works perfectly fine as well. To keep the weeds from seeds from blowing in, and if there are seeds in there, it'll kill them before they, they come to the surface. So that's basically the way I do it. Some people put a pine mulch down, um, and that, and that um, I guess that would probably work on the flowers as well if you happen to have some pine mulch. I do see some mulches at Home Depot and, um, and Lowe's and all those in uh, True Value and all that. That and they're fairly cheap to buy, but you really need a lot. You need like three inches when you when you're doing doing a lot of uh, that landscaping and stuff. But uh, you see the black mulch and bright red mulch and probably purple mulch and all kinds of different colors. From what I'm hearing, this is what Eric told me, and tell me if this is the truth, Eric. Is that soy coloring in there? Oh, in the mulch, I don't know. Oh, it wasn't you that it wasn't no, that. You it was know. definitely not me that told you that. Yeah, so I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's being, you know, cautious about it. I don't know if those, um, that kind of mulch is safe in your, in your uh, pollinator garden. You want to keep it as pure as you can keep it. Of course, it doesn't look as pretty when you put pine mulch down and put a bunch of leaves down there, but hopefully the, the flowers will grow in and, and um, you'll be pretty safe that way. And whatever you put down for mulch, just to let you know, uh, the next year, it, a lot of that will turn to soil as well. It'll, it'll uh, decompose right in and in, in undergo the composting process, and um, it will be good to go. So it's all good. Okay. So I wanted to tell you about, I wanted, and this is another thing that uh, if you want to sign up, I'll send you this. There's this link you can click on. New England Wildflower Society is a very good resource where you can buy your native plants, you can go to some programs uh, and, and, and listen. Uh, you get more information about wildflowers and about protect, protecting our ecosystem. Um, I found a place, as I say, if something's in Vermont, if something's in Maine, you know those cold climates or those short, short summers, I think they're fine, um, you know, good resources for us as well. So the Vermont Wildflower Farm, that, that has some seeds that you can order online, um, you know, if you, if you want to get some seed. And uh, also, we can ask you any questions. BB Veggie Gardens, cards over there if you have any questions about it. A lot of this stuff, since we, like I say, you know, a million times, we specify, you know, in more vegetable line. If we can get any information, we, we have some good resources out there. So, okay. So, before we go for questions, still a little bit of time. So, just so I want to make sure we got these, this is the, the handout that, uh, that everybody. Uh, don't use pesticides, they are very indiscriminate in nature. If something's going to kill a wasp, guess what? It's probably going to kill your bee. So try to stay away from using weed kill. Oh, and then another thing, just another thing. When we talk about uh, weed, uh, excuse me, we talk about killing, killing the critters and uh, we have, a, we have a class here, and you can get the link. We have one on organic, uh, organic remedies. And, it go, and we also have one on companion planting. And there are specific plants that you can grow, you know, like nasturtiums and uh, marigolds that actually help to deter the pests the pest naturally. Another way to, you know, to, to not use these nasty chemicals. So, also, you plant. These perennials mentioned that grow back um, every uh, that grow back year after year. Some of them don't last forever. I remember I was growing some not it's not a wildflower, but I was growing mostly a perennial, right? It was a tulips. I'm thinking tulips. You know they're beautiful. They have 
happened in the Netherlands, you know. But, and they only last like two or three years, I didn't realize. So anyway, perennials don't last forever. So if you lose something, don't worry about it. Go get, go get some more. Also, uh, like I was talking about my borage and other self seeding annuals, pick those up. And uh, the only thing is, when they self seed, you're, you're kind of at the mercy of Mother Nature, so the seed might blow you know, someplace else. So a lot of times you have to pick them up and do some replanting, and you have to mind your garden, or your garden will take advantage of you. You're the boss, you're the dog, you're the tail. So. Also, supplement your soil with the rich organic, organic compost. Does anybody compost here? Okay, so we have, a, we have a composting class here on Saturday. I guess it's Oxbridge Cleanup Day or something. So, uh, and I guess they're going to have some low-cost compost bins. We are, we are, uh, we've been doing this class for years, and I'm, I'm very big into compost. I actually have three compost uh, bins at my house. Terry will tell you, Terry back there will tell you. She's, she's seen them all. Uh, also, the mulching, you know, the, the thought of mulching with, Fresh, uh, crushed fall leaves or straw to keep the soil cool and without uh, any pests and um, any weeds, excuse me, any weeds. Uh, also, if you want, it's not a good, it's not a bad idea to have your, your uh, have a wildflower garden near your veggie garden. Or, if you understand companion planting and all that, you can grow them dispersed. I've seen a lot of people that grow them, the veggies with the, uh, with the flowers as well, so. I asked this guy, I, I went to the flower and garden show, I don't know if it was last or the year before, and uh, I asked, he was a bee guy, and I said, if you grow your flower garden, you know, your pollinator garden, will the bees just concentrate on that and not pollinate your crops? And he said, no, no. Bring them to the area and they'll certainly do, do all the work for you. So, uh, grow, your, uh, grow your flowers and your veggies is good for both, okay? So, and also, uh, you don't know uh, what's in your area. Some bees are tiny, they look, like, they look like a fruit fly. And then you look really close and you say, son of a gun, that's really a little tiny bee. And some of them, of course, you can't mistake the big fat, the big fat uh, bumblebees. But uh, since you don't exactly know what you have in your area, because you probably never, you know, try to spoil them and treat them as nicely as you're going to once you go home and grow this garden, uh, grow a variety of plants. And when you go to get your wildflower, if you do go, go to get the seed, they actually have kits and different kinds together, depending upon what you want to do. Some people broadcast the seed, you get what you get, and other times, um, you know, uh, people like, they may like the color blue. They have all kinds of different combinations of seed that you can get from those places. So, okay. Isn't that true? Do we have any questions? We typically leave a little bit of room at the end um, so that uh, Eric, who's the master gardener, the two of us, can answer your questions. Any questions, gardening questions? This is the quietest group that I think I've ever had. So, any questions back there? Rachel? Nothing. Nothing. Do, um, the, do the bees go to the bee bomb or just the hummingbird? They'll all go to the bee bomb. They will. Butterflies, they'll all go, go there. They love it. So. That's easy to grow up with butterflies. Yeah. I think you should find some stuff, find some plants that are growing. May not work for this year. But what you could do is you could wait and you could go down to the Blackstone Gorge or whatever you have. What do you have? What's that? West Hill Dam, West Hill Dam. right? Yep. And you could go and find some plants. Maybe it's not, maybe you're not supposed to pick plants down there, huh? I'm anyway. about federal land now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't tell you. Just don't tell the like nature. No, I, 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 I do. I, I, uh, yeah. So anyway, maybe they'll do a pollinator garden down there. So. <laughs> But uh, any no no other question. What are some good early flowers from my apple trees that will help bring pollinators? You need okay. So apples come out in when in the fall, right? Uh, no, they'll they'll bloom like in the next month and a half or so. Yeah. 
I think you might have kind of missed the boat if you're going to try to you're going to try to grow something now and that's going to be in full bloom by in one month. I, I'm not I'm not really sure about that. I, I I'm, I'm not really sure any any of those. The only thing I, typically when you grow a perennial, it may take even up to a season if you're going to grow grow it from seed. But uh, I would just go to go if you you'd obviously have to buy a plant. So stop by a nursery or something and find it. Just make sure it's a perennial perennial plant on that list. So because the because nothing's really blooming right now around here. So yeah. Hmm. The only thing you need a lupine would be uh, that early one half as a flower. Yeah. What about something that's potted that you could just keep in the pot? That might work. Yeah. Something that's already established in a pot, maybe you could just get pots. You have to get a lot of pots. I mean, how many applications do you have? Three. I have two. A gala and a, a golden delicious. They're not bearing anything yet. So they're dwarfs and they have a little bit of ways to go. A couple of years. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming, and I hope to see you. I hope to see you at the uh, at the composting uh, presentation on Saturday at twelve thirty.